All right, hi guys. Um, I just wanted to do a little video this morning on a couple of options that we have for those of us that do not want to go the insane anti-aging uh, dermatology esthetician route. Okay, now I'm not saying that that isn't what some people need to do. Sometimes there's skin conditions and things of that nature that you know could potentially benefit from something they offer. However, there are a lot of natural things that, that we have access to as well. Now, over the course of my 30, my gosh, it's been longer than 30 years of studying and being very much into skincare, making my own stuff and uh, learning as much as I can about it and helping other people in addition to whole body head to toe and because skin is an organ obviously <clears throat> although a lot of people kind of forget that they just don't realize that the skin is an organ and it just happens to interface directly with the environment so not only is what we eat and what's going on on the inside of our body that could be in any form anything that gets into our body in any way shape or form can affect our skin and then of course because it is directly interfacing with the environment anything that the skin comes into contact with products water uh, anything absolutely anything just the environment just the air okay uh you know sunscreens bug sprays um lotions potions uh soaps, um, if you're washing your hair, shampoo that drips down onto your skin, not to mention it's going directly into your scalp. We need to constantly remember, if you actually care about your health, that a lot of these products and chemicals have no long-term studies, none. And, you know, we are just pounding our bodies with, with all of these potentially dangerous chemicals every single day. And I don't want to do that. So I stopped putting anything commercial on my skin probably about, yeah, about 30 years ago. Maybe even before that. I was in my, I was like, I was in my early 20s when I, when I really like started to see the bigger picture. Um, I had always seen it like probably more than most people, but I really had this major awakening and epiphany in my, my 20s. Unfortunately, I bought a few narratives that I no longer align with at all. But the, the toxic, you know, toxins and poisons, I remember I was still in college at this time. I was, uh, I had gone to college and then I had gone to nursing school. I, I, <laughs> my, my, my little uh, trajectory was interesting. Um, so I remember being in my apartment and literally wiping out everything. I, I got rid of everything, everything. And I had roommates too. And I was like, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not using this. And they were like, well, I'm not paying money. They were nice. <laughs> they were nice. But they were kind of like, yeah, well, we're not paying $6 for something when we can just buy this on sale for like 99 cents. And I was like, that's fine. I will get all the cleansers. I will get like all the stuff. Of course, I couldn't tell them what they could have in the shower. I'm not going to, you know, tell them what they can use for soap and stuff. But I was like, look, that's fine. I will, I will buy the better stuff. And I started making my own stuff as well. And I remember switching from, again, you know, I think at the time I was using something that I thought was decent. And then I was trying to like find better things. Uh, I think I was using Aubrey at that point, maybe. I know I had used Aveda for a little while, um, which wasn't really natural. Uh, and then I believe I went to the Aubrey, and then I think I played around with a couple of things. There was a local health food store, and I think I was playing around with a couple of different products from there. And then my husband and I ended up moving into an apartment by ourselves, and I started making my own stuff, and again, I briefly worked for Anne Marie Borland uh, during kind of this whole transition period. I had used different things and I got a really nice little education through the Anne Marie Borland 
experience and that dove me down more into the science of the skin and I had a little bit of a background already to begin with just with my my science background and my own initial desire to learn more about it and then I got that little education and then it kind of set me on my way so I started making my own stuff and basically stopped using all the other stuff and my skin started to improve dramatically uh, and again I never had horrible skin, but it definitely made a difference when I when I basically stopped doing all of that, stopped washing my face, um, started using only natural things on my skin, and my skin responded really, really well. I've always had really hyper, hypersensitive skin. It's even more sensitive now. So for those of us that don't want to support that mentality of looking youthful as long as possible. Like, who cares? I just, like, who cares? I wanna look as good as I can. And I wanna take care of my skin. I want my skin to be healthy. That is my goal, healthy. I'm not really interested in beating it up. I'm not interested in lasering it off, burning it off, peeling it off. I'm not interested in that, to look young, okay? There's nothing about being young that I want or need. There, nothing, nothing. I look at young people and I kind of feel sorry for them. <laughs> like. Boy, man, like, like getting to this point in your life, like, <clears throat> I, I don't know, man. I don't know why anybody would want to look young. I really just don't get it. I really don't get it. And again, there's a big difference between wanting to take care of yourself and do things that support your health. And obviously, the healthier you are, we'd like to think the better you will look, okay? Supporting and enhancing versus completely changing, rearranging, manipulating, um, you know, to look like something that you completely are not, like completely changing the way that you look, which again, I just, I can't relate to. No shame on people who do it, um, but that's, that's really the transhuman agenda, to get people to not love themselves the way that they are and to not value the wisdom, the experience, and the life, all of the life that has actually made this right that that this is a reflection of the road that you have traveled to me it's such a beautiful thing it's such a beautiful thing you know wrink little wrinkles yes i've smiled i've cried i've you know gone through some really really hard times in my life i'm actually surprised i don't look 90 to be perfectly honest and i feel like damn for what i've gone through okay um i'm all right i'm all right so when people look at us they are looking at us, right? They're looking at us and they're looking at us going, you know, what is it that they say when they see someone who looks haggard and old, someone that's smoked and drank and, you know, whatever. Oh, they've had a hard life, right? They've had a hard life because it shows, right? It doesn't mean that if you look good, you haven't had a hard life, but I'm just saying that it's pretty well known that when you've kind of gone through the ringer, it does show up in your being on the outside, oftentimes. So yes, it's nice to be able to support that and you know heal things. Maybe if we've had too much sun and we've got some precancerous lesions or what have you, um, you know, to heal that with natural remedies. And I've actually healed two things on my face with natural remedies, and I've helped other people heal some precancerous lesions as well. And I've already talked about how I believe this one was a full-blown skin cancer. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I've, I've already talked about that in another in another video. Had all of the all of the telltale signs, every single one of them. Uh, and with my background, uh, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that that's what it was, and it is completely gone now. Um, the only thing that you can see is the faintest, and I'm talking faintest. You have to actually look really, really close. Um, it barely looks like a freckle, like barely, barely a freckle at all. And I'm assuming that I've always had the freckle. And the freckle was definitely turning into something uh, pretty gnarly. Uh, and, it, and it grew over the course of years, of course. And then it got to the point where I was like, ooh, I need to do something about this. Um, and then I got the one on my forehead, which I went carnivore. Wasn't doing anything like hardcore, but I went carnivore, noticed I had it, and was spending a little extra time, you know, doing stuff. Not aggressively, though, because it wasn't it wasn't as advanced as this one and I was like oh, I'm just gonna do and I'm gonna see what happens with it and 
I had had it a while and I started treating it and it went away. It went away after probably a couple of months. So that was pretty impressive because I probably had it about two years, two or three years that I was aware of it. Okay, I have to say that, aware of it because I'm not, you know, I'm not like checking my skin out all the time. So I wanna talk a little bit about just again, different options that we have. We've got all of the, the facial oils that you see in the beauty world. Make sure they are cold pressed, high quality, fresh. I mean, that should go without saying. You are gonna have to experiment to find what your skin loves. That's just the reality of it, okay? Uh, your skin does make sebum. Our skin is very adapted and tolerates oils and fats. It's just finding the ones that work the best for you, okay? To say you can't put oil on your skin, then that would mean sebum is a problem. And if sebum is a problem for you, then your skin is really out of whack, okay? Because sebum is essential. It is essential for skin health. And if your skin is not healthy and your sebum is not healthy, which is very unlikely that your sebum is not healthy, could be diet, could be other things in your body that are not contributing to healthy sebum. Okay, the bacteria on your, your face could be completely unbalanced. That biome could be completely reversed of what it should be. So there's all sorts of things that come into play. Could have suffered too much sun damage over the years, so now your, your skin is just not working right. So again, there's all of the natural fats and oils. My favorites are tallow, pork lard, duck fat, and into that, I add jojoba and a little bit of extremely high quality olive oil, okay? And that's what I use for my face. For my body, I will add in some coconut oil and there are some other things that I will add in. For my face, I will work with really good quality rosehip seed oil, carrot seed oil as well. Um, I really try to stay, well, I do stay away. I do stay away from any of the oils that are stabilized and preserved with like rosemary extract or honeysuckle extract or any of those things. They are preservatives, which means they are active ingredients and they can be irritating for some people. And I don't wanna disrupt the healthy biome on my skin. Okay, so I prefer not to use those. Okay, so I'm looking at my things. I have two, two containers. I, I really like the Myron glass, but those are expensive and I've the caps tend to break and I got a whole bunch of jars with no caps. So I ended up just putting them in plastic. So, which I do recommend glass. If you can get glass jars, that's ideal, okay? And I like the Myron, they're the dark purple, but they're so expensive. I used to buy them in bulk and again, they're still expensive, even in bulk. If you buy them individually, they're really expensive, but they're so beautiful. They're almost black, like they look black. They're gorgeous, they're dark, dark, dark purple. Anyway, these are not in glass right now. So, because if you're gonna put active ingredients in here like resins, oleo resins, resins, CO2s, essential oils, although I really don't use much essential oil on the face anymore. I used to when I first got into aromatherapy simply because CO2s and oleo resins were just not really around as much. Like it was those things, honestly, I didn't even learn about CO2s until, you know, quite a ways after. I've, I've been a professional aromatherapist for a very, very long time. Uh, oh my gosh, 25 years, I think. I got certified about 25 years ago. The journey of learning was way before that. And of course, I'm still learning all the time, but um, I don't even think I heard about CO2s. I don't even know if they were around back then. They probably were, but I didn't know about them. And then the whole oleo resin, like, balsam of copaiba, um, things like that, absolutely gorgeous. And they are typically much more gentle for the skin. Okay, so this is my face balm. It is the oils that I just talked about recently, and it does have some myrrh, frankincense, balsam copaiba <clears throat> in the CO2 form. The balsam of copaiba is an oleo resin now. I do not recommend that people use frankincense and myrrh unless their skin is really damaged and they really need it. And again, I, at the moment, am trying to heal some past sun damage, okay? And the residual hangover 
of having the severe frostbite on my face. So this is my active, like this is my, this is my medicine. Okay, this is medicine. If you do not need the myrrh and the frankincense, don't use them. Use other things that are not as expensive, not as precious, not on the threatened list. Again, don't use what you don't need, okay? So this is my powerhouse, all right? And this is my plain one. This doesn't have any active ingredients in it, okay? It is just the bomb, the fats. There's no beeswax. I don't put beeswax on my face. Um, I will on my body, but my face does better without it. Okay, so this is what I use. Now, I wanna introduce another ingredient that some people have a problem with. And I wanna tell you why you should reconsider if you have issues with this. So my son, of course, peeled the label off because, you know, why not? But this is pure Vaseline, the pure stuff. Triple refined, completely clean, completely pure. Won't find a purer product on the planet, I don't think. Okay, now let's get a few things out of the way. Okay, petrolatum comes from the earth, completely natural. Goes through a triple refining process to remove any impurities. So it is pure, pure. There's nothing in there to harm human health, okay? They've done multiple studies on it over the years, all right? Incredibly healing. Not necessarily healing in its own right. I don't see it as an active ingredient because it's more inert, but it does seal in so that your body's immune response and your body's healing abilities can, can go without a hitch, okay? Where you're not gonna get a growth of potentially dangerous bacteria that could cause sepsis, massive infections, on and on and on. Okay, it is an incredible healing substance, incredible. And if you actually learn about the history of it, it's pretty incredible. And I'm talking go back a really, really long time because the guy, I forget the guy's name, the guy that uh, discovered it with the guys working on the oil rigs were treating their burns and their wounds and stuff with the petroleum straight from the earth in its unrefined form and they were healing, their wounds and burns were healing exponentially faster. Okay, so he decided that he was going to purify it and turn it into a, a sellable product. Now, the ancient people have used petroleum products. Okay, so again, this is nothing new. This is absolutely nothing new. They used it for fuel, for medicine, meaning medicine for the body, the skin, they used it in all sorts of ointments and salves. And when I first started getting into natural healing 35 years ago, a lot of the formulas were petroleum or mineral oil, okay? So there's nothing wrong with these products. I was brainwashed years ago as well, okay? When I was vegan, I bought the petroleum lye and it is a lie, okay? I learned, okay? And that's the goal. We should be learning, constantly learning and growing. So the key here is, you know, to not have things that are exploited, right? We don't want to exploit nature. We don't want to use up all her goodness, okay? We want to use them reasonably and wisely. And that's why I'm huge into not using like the myrrh and the frankincense unless you really need to. If there is a better thing to use that grows abundantly, okay, and isn't on the endangered list or the threatened list, well, not endangered because you're not going to have access to it unless you're out there getting it yourself. But, you know, you, you just don't want to do that, okay? You want to use things that are more abundant, okay? But there's a time and a place for using those precious medicines, because myrrh and frankincense is my go-to for skin cancers and for any kind of like really serious skin issue. And I also love the balsam of copaiba, which is cheaper and you can get it in the oleo resin form, which is the bomb because it is super gentle and actually has more healing properties. So it's actually like win-win, okay? So using things that grow around us is a great idea too. So, you know, you wanna harvest things like plantain and, you know, different things in our environment that we can actually turn into infused oils, add them into our face products or body products and use those because they are abundant. They are more available and they work, okay? So again, it's being really mindful of what we're doing. So, using Vaseline 
you can add it into your product. Some people don't want to use it on their face. Um, some people do very well with it. Some people <clears throat> may not do well with it. Okay, again, it's just all trial and error and always experimenting. Okay, you can always add a little bit to whatever you're using and see how you do with it. The key is to make sure that your skin is not filthy before you're putting it on. So what I do, I don't use soap, and I've talked about this before. I use a makeup remover cloth. It gets dirt off your skin. Uh, it's amazing. It, this thing is amazing, and I don't need to use soap. And it's really funny. I was listening to the owner of Lily Lolo. No, not listening. I think I have listened to her before, but anyway, I was reading reading a conversation, reading a blog. And she said, cleanser never touches her face. She only uses a makeup remover. So I'm not the only one who does this. And I do wear mineral powder sometime, and this removes it perfectly. However, it takes about three three washes in between. So you use it, you clean it, you use it, you clean it, and you do it until the cloth is completely clean. Okay, and that's that's what you need to do. And you need to be really gentle because you don't want to be aggressive with this. Okay, so it's got the two sides. You've got to make sure that you use the right side and be very, very gentle with it. You have to make sure this stays relatively wet. Okay, when I first started using it, I made the mistake of using it slightly, it wasn't dry, but it was definitely not wet enough. <clears throat> and you gotta have it have enough water in it because you don't want it to irritate the skin, okay? But it does work and I use it on my neck and my chest and after I use it, after a long day, especially being outside, my cloth will be brownish black. So it absolutely gets all the stuff off and then I will wash it with my Dr. Bronner's Unscented Soap and then clean it off really good, rinse it off really good, make sure there's no soap residue in it, and I will do it again, and I will do it until it is white, until it is absolutely clean. And then I put my face product on so that you're not sealing in any dirt into your skin. So believe it or not, a lot of people, especially if you wear like heavy makeup and things like that, um, their cleansers and stuff aren't getting it all off. So what's happening is, is you've still got stuff in your skin. And then if you put an occlusive on top of it, which is what Vaseline is, it's an occlusive, you're just trapping that under the skin. Okay, so again, you know, just something to think about. So Vaseline is a great addition. And the great thing about it is it's cheap, it's available, and it's amazing. Okay, now would I use it instead of my other things? No, not unless I had to. If I had to, then I would use it, obviously. I just told my husband the other day, I said, definitely gonna stock up on the Vaseline because it's inert. As long as it's not opened, it lasts for a really, really long time, whereas the fats and oils definitely don't last as long, okay? Um, so again, it's just a nice thing to have, and it's great for a first aid kit too because, um, you know, it's great for sealing wounds up so that wounds can heal, and then you don't have to use like antibiotic creams and things of that nature, which I personally would never use. Never, ever, ever use any of those commercial products, okay? Um, they do destroy the healthy flora of your skin. Uh, people have been known to have reactions to the preservatives and, you know, all of that stuff, so you want to be really, really careful. But people can react to anything, anything that's an active ingredient, and the good thing about Vaseline is that it's inert, okay, which means the chances of it causing a reaction are slim to none, slim to none, okay, so again, it's a great product when it comes to that, and um, I know my grandmother used to use it for all sorts of stuff, and a lot of people who don't want to put it on their whole face will use it, like, around their eyes, uh, you know, maybe on their neck and chest, and, you know, use other things on their face, you know, whatever, you just, you just got to find what works for you, okay, so the last thing that I want to say about this is that no product, zero, nothing. I don't care if you're using zinc bombs. I don't care if you're using the most expensive, fancy, beautiful product that has so many amazing things in it for your skin. You're noticing amazing transformation with your skin. It's looking great or whatever. Never neglect the internal environment of your body. Never neglect how important it is to create good skin from within okay from the inside making sure that your body is nourished with what the human body needs and that's going to be slightly different for people because people have 
different metabolisms. We have different detoxification properties. We have different absorption rates of food and nutrition. We have different abilities to actually, you know, go through the entire process of eat, eliminate, and everything that happens in between, okay? We're all different when it comes to that. And when you get to be my age, okay, you've been through a lot. You've been through a lot. And at this stage of the game, our bodies have developed in a way that we might be really, really, really poor at getting nutrition from these types of things. And for me, it's plant foods. I, I just cannot get the nutrition that I need from the plant foods. And they, they are toxic for me, unfortunately, unfortunately, because I love them. I love them. Um, but they are toxic for me. And I've been experimenting for seven years. I've been carnivore for seven years. And I've been experimenting, trying to add little things back in here and there. My body does not like them at all. Something as simple as a few peas in my, my lunch. My body just doesn't like it. I'm not talking about junk food. I haven't eaten junk food in over 30 years. Not regularly anyway. I'm not saying like if I go to a birthday party that I'm not going to have a handful of chips or a little bite of birthday cake. But um, seven years ago, I went carnivore and <clears throat> I've been living that lifestyle. And I say carnivore, carnivore-ish. I still have my tea in the morning, not giving that up, okay? And uh, I'll have a little bit of ice cream in the summer because my kids always loved it and I would make ice cream with fresh cream from the farm, frozen blueberries or something, a little bit of sweetener, you know, whether it's honey, maple syrup, organic sugar, not a lot though, just a little bit. My kids don't need it really, really sweet. Uh, because I, I tried to keep them away from super, super sweet things when they were little so that they wouldn't develop that that need for super sweet things. And I throw a bunch of egg yolks in there and uh, a little vanilla. Uh, and so I will have like a little bit. And I do okay as long as I don't have too much. But if I start adding in things like strawberries and uh, my kids like a pina colada ice cream, which is amazing. It's like coconut and pineapple and mango, whatever. But I don't do so well with that. It definitely triggers me. So over the years, I've learned, oh, I can have a little bit of this. That definitely doesn't work for me. But where I'm going with this is if the foods that you're eating are causing a lot of inflammation in the body, it is going to affect your skin. If you're not eating foods that your body is able to get maximum nutrition out of, it is absolutely going to affect your skin. Okay, so the idea is internal and external. And I tell people this all the time when I work with people that have things like eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis, any of these skin issues, is that the external medicine is one piece of it. But you have to work on the inside. Okay, you have to work on the inside to bring balance. Okay, so the external remedies are to keep people from going out of their mind, okay, protecting the skin so that it can heal, putting on things like zinc bombs and Vaseline and maybe going in with some active ingredients if, they're, if their skin tolerates it in the time that it takes for their body to really repair and really heal and really regain its sense of balance instead of being like, you know, on the, the crazy roller coaster. So super important, nutrition, and if what you're doing isn't working, it's not working. Don't keep banging your head against the wall, okay? I did the meat and vegetable thing for about 10 years, eating just meat, drinking raw milk, and vegetables. I gave up dairy, thinking it was the dairy. I had already been vegan, so I knew it wasn't the meat. I was the most miserable when I didn't eat meat. Never in my mind could I fathom that vegetables were not working for me, never. And it took me a long time to figure it out. It took me a long time to figure it out. So now my diet consists of meat, raw milk, <clears throat> and again, I'm not 100% rigid. I'm always trying to add in little bits of vegetables, like maybe a few green beans here, a few pieces of asparagus there, whatever. But what I can say is that it usually doesn't go so great for me. So I'm, you know, here I am. And again, 
I have my black tea in the morning. And the one thing about the black tea, for as much as I love it, like I'm not getting rid of it, I love it. And I have uh, just a tiny, tiny bit of honey in it and some fresh cream from the farm. The black tea helps me from dumping oxalates. Now, the raw milk, and I've always said this, it saved my life because I had severe oxalate damage. So I do believe, and I ended up in the emergency room and clinic a few times, I literally was dying. Um, and I do believe that the raw milk has saved my life and I will not give it up ever unless I was absolutely forced to uh, because I wasn't able to get it. I would probably get my own cow at that point to be perfectly honest. So in addition to the milk that binds with the oxalates, okay, the black tea keeps a tiny, tiny amount of oxalates coming into my body so that my body doesn't get the trigger signal to dump, okay, because the dumping is what can kill you and it's very dangerous and I've gone through some oxalate dumping periods before when I've given up the dairy or I've backed off on my raw milk. It's nightmare, nightmare. I literally thought I was dying and for those of you that know me know that I don't go to the doctors for any reason unless I really think I'm dying, okay? So I thought I was dying. It was terrifying. Most terrifying experience of my life. So I'm gonna leave you guys with that because my video is already a half hour long, okay? So I know I gave you a lot to think about, but there it is, okay? Signing out.